Hello, Devaj. Hi, Devaj. How are you this morning? Hi, Yes, here too. Uh, what was that? Yes, uh, uh, I'm Yash. Uh, I'm Devaj. Both of us are here. Both of oh, us are okay. here. I hear you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming. We're going to wait for some more people. Yeah. Hello? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. There we go. Hello, Vinay. I guess uh, I don't know who else is joining us. Uh, Jesse said he'd probably be here. There he is. Hi, Jesse. So yeah, I think I don't know who else is joining us. Uh, but what? Uh, yeah, why don't we get started and then when they join in. Uh, so today we're gonna. This is the last meeting of the year, calendar year. Okay, hi, Jesse. Uh, okay, it'll be fairly limited. So the first thing we'll be doing is uh, doing the hierarchical temporal modeling uh, talk. And there's Ajwal. Okay. Hello, Ajwal. Uh, first thing we'll be doing is the hierarchical temporal modeling talk. And then we'll go on to talking about GSOC 2020. Um, and uh, Ajwal wanted to talk about that. I'm just going to kind of go over what our... Plan, what the plan is and, you know, uh, what the schedule is for that. It's coming up pretty soon. I know this is a summer program, but the planning starts very early on this, like in, at the end of the calendar year, the previous year. So we have to kind of come up with ideas now, um, and then we'll be, uh, you know, ready to go by the time that students are soliciting the program in January and February. Then we'll be uh, talking about two papers. One from that one thing that Vinay actually uh, put up, um, and we'll I'll share my I'll show you that and we'll discuss that. And then um, Jesse also had a paper that we're, we'll just do a quick discussion of. He's going to present it in a later time. So let's get started. Then uh, let me share my screen first. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, let me uh, start the presentation. <coughs> All 
All right. So this is this is going to tie together a lot of what we've been talking about in the last several weeks. Um, hierarchical temporal modeling and maybe some alternate approaches to that. So uh, hierarchical temporal modeling, HTM, this model was proposed by Jeff Hawkins, who is the inventor of the Palm Pilot. And that's him here at the upper left, the upper left hand corner of this set of pictures here. Um, he wrote a book in about 2004. It was a popular book called On Intelligence. And so he uh, he was he did he was working in industry. He designed the Palm Pilot and he had these ideas about how the brain works. And they weren't really mainstream neuroscience. They were more theoretical neuroscience. And especially at the time <clears throat> that he wrote this book, uh, neuroscience theory was not very well developed. Um, I've seen him talk, give a talk where he has the slide that shows like neuroscience as a, like uh, neuroscience theory is sort of like the tip of an iceberg. Oh, hello, Susan. Welcome. Actually, why don't we have Susan introduce herself? Uh, Susan is a semester, and she just got a chance now to join in. Hello, Susan. Oh, <laughs> hi, Susan. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, she's got to put her earphones on and and so forth. Yeah, so anyways, Jeff Hawkins had this thing on. Um, he had sort of the uh, neuroscience is like this iceberg. And theory is like the, the tip of the iceberg, and data is the under the iceberg under the water. So we'll keep that in mind. And then, Susan, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wait, you can hear me? Oh, great. Okay. Uh, my name is Susan Crawford Young, and I was um, Vic Gordon's former student. And I'm currently doing a PhD at the University of Manitoba in Biosystems Engineering, and I hope to image some axolotl embryos in, in OCT, Optical Coherence Tomography. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, thank you for joining us. So we'll be, uh, we're going to have a, a bunch of discussions here, and uh, so if you have any questions, just you know, you can put it in the chat or uh, say something. So, so we should I turn in. off? Oh, is that sorry? Oh, should I turn off my camera? No, you can turn. You can, you know, if you want to mute yourself in case there's any background noise, but you can keep your camera on if you want. Okay. Okay. So we were just starting the, uh, this talk on hierarchical temporal modeling. So I'm pretty much at the beginning. So I'll just keep going. Uh, so I trust everyone can still see my screen here. And I'll go to the slide and I'll keep... So this is uh, Jeff Hawkins. This is uh, Dilep George, who's a... Dilep George, who's a... Was a neuros... Uh, I think he got his PhD in neuroscience at Stanford. And he wrote a dissertation mm -hmm. called How the Brain Might Work, a Hierarchical and Temporal Model for Learning and Recognition. And so I have both of... And I'll send these slides out as usual. Uh, both of these links, this is a link to resources on the Unintelligence book, and this is a link to Deleep's uh, dissertation. And together they came up with this idea called the CLA, or the Cortical Learning Algorithm. And um, so this is what we're kind of talking about when we talk about hierarchical temporal modeling. So this is the neocortex, and many of you will recognize this, maybe from textbooks or maybe... Like, if you know anything about neocortex, you know that neocortex is a series of repeated um, sort of, there are six layers, and then there are repeated columns across the cortex. And the, these are the six layers here that are, you know, they, they, they have a depth to them. So you have from layer one to layer six, and they're numbered here. 
the white matter is at the bottom and the cortical surface is at the top. And what you have here is you have a uh, set of dendrites uh, going up and down the columns uh, and, and neurons that are interconnected. And so there's a bunch of processing that happens at each layer. And so you get the top layers are, you know, taking inputs from other regions of cortex. The middle layer is taking inputs from the thalamus, which is a different structure in the in the midbrain. And then there's a and then the lower set of layers taking uh, inputs from the brainstem or in the hindbrain. And basically things get processed this way. So this cortical layer could be in the uh, visual area, like in, in V1 or V2. So it deals with visual inputs mainly. It could be in the auditory cortex, which is sort of in the temporal area, um, which is means side here, not time. But uh, they all have basically the same structure. And there are evolutionary reasons for this, of course, because it's easy to sort of replicate a structure than to invent new structures. But in humans, we have a greatly expanded neocortex. And we devote a lot of our brain to this sort of structure where you have these neurons that are or neural pathways that are organized in layers like this. And you can see using different types of staining uh, from, you know, in uh, Golgi, Nissel, and Weigart, which are different types of staining they use in neuroscience. I'm not going to get into the sort of the procedure of each one. Uh, the Golgi stain shows these, uh, the, the axons and the uh, initial stain shows the cell bodies mainly, but you can see that they're the or, with that things are organized. There are differences between the layers, and there's also structural differences as well as functional differences between the layers. Now that's pretty important for this technique because it does rely on these layers and a layered approach to processing. So the attributes of the HTM technique. I have a table here that I got out of a blog post. Uh, here in this in this table they compare hierarchical temporal modeling with deep learning and so they have all these attributes so number the first attribute is the premise meaning what's the model based on an htm is based on a biological model whereas deep learning is based on a mathematical model i mean people can argue about how a biological a neural network is but htms are more biological than deep learning networks by and large. Um, and the maybe the more important, two other important things to note here is learning type and batch size needed to learn. So the learning type of HTM is unsupervised. And in deep learning, you need to, it's a supervised approach. So you need input data. With HTM, it's basically unsupervised. So you can plug data into it and get something useful out. I'm not really sure if you actually do need some sort of training, but they do. There is a learning curve, of course, but the basically the the selling point here is that it's considered unsupervised learning. Um, but the batch size needed to learn then that means that for HTMs, small that very small data sets are sufficient to do an analysis, whereas with deep learning you require huge amounts of data, and so this is a this is a, you know, a probably a debatable er issue, but this is important, an important set of attributes for the HTM. So uh, HTMs are unsupervised. They're similar sort of to clustering or maybe like self-organized maps, if you've heard of that. It's kind of an obscure method that they use in uh, computational linguistics and other areas. Um, it learns continuously from new input patterns. Uh, it's actually specialized for time-dependent sequences. So when I showed you the brain, the uh, those columns, when things are processed down columns of cortex like that, it takes into account two things. It takes into account spatial context of the data, but also temporal context and the sort of the order in which things are presented to the network. Um, and it's also robust with respect to inputs and outputs. So it's a high capacity network and it has high noise tolerance. And it's suited for prediction, anomaly detection and sensory motor control. So, you know, putting it into things like robots or putting it into things like uh, self-driving cars would be feasible. 
So this is an example, and this figure came up kind of blurry in this mode, but uh, this is comparing a pyramidal neuron and an HTM neuron. So this kind of neuron is a biological neuron, a pyramidal neuron, and that's uh, because it's shaped like a pyramid. You have uh, dendrites down here and dendrites up here, and there are more dendrites down here. And what happens in this neuron is you get feed forward from other neurons at this part of the, of the network. So you have all these these dendrites that are taking inputs from other neurons, and they get uh, they you know they get summed in the cell body here. So the, all those signals go to the cell body and they get summed here. There's also context, which is uh, you know part of the feed forward signal that happens when you get these interactions between uh, dendrites and things like that. So they all come up into the cell body. And like in theoretical neuroscience, they have sort of uh, functions for the summation process. But basically, those inputs are summed or somehow weighted. And then they're sent up to the, uh, up the axon and then out to other neurons. But you also get feedback from other neurons at the synapses up here. So you get like feedback from other neurons here and you get feed forward signal from other neurons here. So that's the typical structure of a pyramidal neuron. The context is nonlinear, so it occurs in contact with these feed forward branches. So I mean it's it's all hard to disentangle in a computational model, but it works pretty well biologically. Um, by contrast, we have the HTM neuron, which is this thing here. And as you can see, there is uh, there are a series of registers, and those registers all sort of fit into this uh, cell body or, or processing unit. And you have feedback, context, and feed forward all kind of uh, being sort of collected in a register and then sent into this neuron. There are actually uh, a number of summation functions here. So there's one for feedback one for context, one for feed forward. It all goes into this neuron and then it goes out to other neurons. And the output is here. And so uh, feedback and context are parallel registers. They don't really co-occur like they do in, in the real neuron. And feed forward is a convolution of feedback and context. So when it enters the main cell, it's convolved somehow and then you have an output. So it does mimic real neurons, but there are differences. I wanted to point that out. Now, this is an example of a real uh, example of like something that you can use HTM for. And this is only one example. But this is something from their literature. Uh, this is a, a task where you have a hand, and the hand is touching a, um, a mug. And so you have these proprioceptive uh, points on your finger where you're using your touch to, you know, grab onto the mug and, you know, do it so that you're not squeezing it too hard and breaking the mug, but you're not holding it too loosely and drop it. So, and then you want to move your hand as well and move it to somewhere else. So there are a lot of things that actually go on in the brain when that happens. Um, so this network has to encode these proprioceptive stimuli, and it does this using this cortical hierarchy. Um, it does this by bringing in sensory input, but also locational input. So there are locations on the mug that are important relative to your fingertips. And your fingertips then grab those locations and move the mug. But those locations have a spatial context. And your sensory input from your fingertips also has a context, which is temporal, meaning that, you know, there's a time that before you touch the mug, when you have the mug in your hand, and then as you're moving it, there's uh, differences in time in terms of the grip and things like that. So there's a lot of information that comes into here. And so you end up having locational inputs and sensory inputs brought together in this input layer. And these happen actually in different columns. So for each location on this mug, they represent it with a different column, cortical column. And things come into the input and they get processed, but they also get sent up another level to the output layer. And the output layer actually is stable with regard to the sensor movement, but it also is used to communicate across columns. 
So the inputs are here, and those change relative to the sensor position, which is your sensor is your fingertip, but it could be a robot hand too. So that's why they use the term sensor. Um, and then the outputs, which remain stable relative to the sensor position. So the outputs are here, and those kind of put this these these uh, moving targets into a framework that can be sort of shared amongst the different locations and hence the different columns. So that's one task that they were able to model using this technique. And that's how you would set the problem up. So for different problems, you'd set the columns up differently, but they basically work in this way. And so Jeff Hawkins uh, has a quote, and it, I don't know where it came from, but I, I found it online. If you solve a problem no one has solved before, people will take notice. And he's referring to his approach, which is, of course, people will ask when he gives these presentations on it, how does this differ from deep learning and how is it better than deep learning? And so his answer is, if you haven't solved it, you know, if you can solve something no one solved, and by solve, I mean, like, uh, find, maybe not find a solution to, but perform well on, people will take notice and say, oh, that's a pretty good technique. So one way you can do that is you can address perhaps morphogenesis with the HTM model, given our interests in this group. Um, and I just brought up two examples for people who aren't familiar. You have Turing's reaction diffusion model, and you have positional information. And so those are two competing models in the literature. Uh, but let's think about that maybe in terms of using the HTM approach to like maybe how would we like rephrase this these you know questions of morphogenesis but using the HTM model and so this would be a totally different approach than either RD or positional information how would we how would we apply uh, HTM to this problem so I just bring this slide up just to kind of get people thinking and you know I'll share the slides and you can think about it later how would you apply so I mean we've been talking about how met apply deep learning and machine learning techniques like, you know, uh, regression and other types of things to uh, biological problems like image processing. Uh, one of the problems in image processing is this morphogenesis problem, which you'll find in, you know, characterized in, say, like movies of, of um, you know, developmental processes. How could we model that using HTM? And is it even appropriate? So I'm not going to discuss that now, but I want people to think about that, and maybe we can discuss that later in different ways. So I want to get on to the other alternative models. So I've been talking about HTM, but there are other models that are very different from, say, like uh, deep learning and machine learning that I wanted to cover, just, again, to get people thinking about it and be aware that it exists. So the first is neuromorphic models. So there are neuromorphic models that are that's a, they call them neuromorphic models. And here's an, uh, a good article that's recent from ZDNet. So it's a popular uh, journal or a popular magazine online. And they did this article about sort of a resurgence in neuromorphic computing. And so the idea here is you actually build something that looks like, um, you know, a, a, a set of neurons and you're using functions to characterize its behavior. Um, instead of using like a typical neural network, you're using something that looks more like a, you know, something in, that you would find in the brain. And so um, you're using like rate coding and things like that, which are uh, things from like uh, theoretical neuroscience that they've characterized. Uh, a lot of people argue that it isn't really the network that's important. It's the sort of the temporal pattern of the electrical activity goes through the network. So they have concepts like rate coding and, um, you know, other types of codings that, you know, you take like action potentials, you take like spikes and, you know, you kind of sum them up or you count them, count their interval or whatever. They're different types of coding. Um, and then you, and that, that's the important parameter in these networks. Not so much the topology per se. So, you know, the idea would be you train something to have a characteristic, uh, you know, 
a pattern of electrical activity. In this case, it would just be activity, but that would be the output of the network. And so there's neuromorphic models, and I'm not really doing it justice, but I just wanted to bring your attention to it. This is a uh, better example here. There are two papers that I found in the literature, uh, fairly recent papers on applications of neuromorphic models. So you have, you know, you have this network, you have a computational layer, but what's important about neuromorphic models is you can encode them into hardware. So there are a lot of uh, models that have been encoded into hardware. Uh, Carver Mead was a pioneer in this area. He was uh, about 25 years ago or so. He developed uh, neuromorphic models that you can encode directly into hardware. And they have this sort of design where instead of using like a, um, you know, a neural network, you're using something more akin to a circuit. And so they're a different way, but they're designed in a way that's, you know, mimics sort of what the brain is doing instead of like a traditional circuit. Um, Here's another example where they focus on the synapses and the exchange of neurochemicals. So they're actually trying to simulate this process, which is where you have uh, pre and post synaptic um, areas and you have an exchange of biochemicals between the two um, between the two structures. And this is, of course, chemical communication between the two cells and then they're you know simulating um electrical activity due to these things so this is a very complex system in and of itself and in like deep learning this is rendered invisible but you can also focus on this area of the brain to see you know at this level of description to you know come up with some interesting uh representations Another approach is called dendritic trees. And so this is, again, where you're using a different part of the neural machinery to sort of represent your problem. So instead of using, again, like a, a deep learning network where you have connections between nodes that mimic neurons and then you use weights to mimic synapses, you're actually using, uh, you're computing on what they call dendritic trees. And again, I'm not going to walk through it uh, in detail. But I'm going to point you to a review paper here where they talk about sort of using dendritic trees as a memory structure. And so they actually review, you know, what's going on in the brain. And then this, this author, Mel, um, he's actually done a bunch of work on the, in this area. Uh, he's at USC in the U.S., University of Southern California. Um, Bartlett Mel is his full name. And he's done a lot of published a lot of work on these dendritic trees. And so that's another way you can represent your problems in terms of what's going on in the dendrites as opposed to like in the cell body itself. And then finally, there's an, an approach, and I wanted to mention this. This is a little bit closer to neural networks, but it's different from like deep learning and other types of neural networks that we've talked about. And that is neuroevolution and something called NEAT, which is, uh, uh, what does it stand for? It's, uh, oh yes, uh, neural evolution through augmenting topologies. So you're basically evolving uh, neural networks. And so they use a genetic algorithm for this. So the idea is you have a neural network. And it's interacting with its environment. And there's a fitness function that's used to set the weights and to shape the topology of the network. Um, the genetic algorithm is, is, so they call these things a hybrid model, where you have two competing models or two, no, I don't know if they're competing, but the in this case, the models are working together to ensure some sort of uh, action. So you have this neural network, which takes in observations, and there's action that's made on the environment, and then that results in a fitness. So imagine like in a neural network where you have a bunch of images, you bring in images, they, um, you know, you evaluate them. And instead of having, say, like a loss function, you have a fitness function, which is then controlled by a genetic algorithm. And the genetic algorithm then is able, you're able to optimize the genetic algorithm 
in ways that improve the performance of the neural network over time. So instead of having like a loss function where you're trying to uh, minimize it, but you don't really know what parameter to minimize on, the genetic algorithm is able to actually, uh, you know, do something a little bit more continuous. And as long as you get the fitness function fairly right, you can do, you know, you can have a, a lot better uh, solution to your problem. So there are a couple of uh, citations here. Uh, and this is basically just talking about how do you evolve a neural network using these type of topologies. Um, it's an area that's been around since, you know, maybe the early 2000s. But, you know, people have published on it. There's been a, in fact, this review was from this year. So people are using this approach. And if you look it up online, there are even, like, videos of uh, people incorporating this into robots, robotic design, and other types of applications video game. Uh, I think there was one where they were using it to uh, play video games like they would do with a deep learning model where they tested on Atari games. But uh, yeah, there's some interesting applications there. So that's it for that. Uh, I wanted to go through that talk and I wanted to keep it fairly short because we're going to be doing these other things. Let's go to the questions. So we have, let's see, we go up to um, Devanch had a question. Uh, registers in HTM network seem a lot similar to L LSTM and GRU gates. Um, yeah, I think they probably are similar in some ways. Uh, I'm not really sure uh, what the differences are because I'm prepared for that. But I they yeah, they may well be. Um, Dick, both models are probably wrong. Well, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Now, you were talking, both models, you were talking about, like, the deep learning and HTM, or, I mean, that's, you know, the, the these are all models, and they're probably, you know, they, there's this saying that says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we kind of maybe go by that uh, philosophy <laughs> in a lot of this. Yeah. So, I mean, let's keep that in mind that they, you know, um, I think I think the the this is an interesting foray into you know getting closer to like how the brain works, but of course you don't really know how that works because it's like there's the brain does so much that a lot of these models can't do, and we don't really understand why the brain does it. That's why we have you know people are exploring things like dendritic networks and and other aspects of neural processing. Um, and so Dick has pointed to his book Embryogenesis Explained. So that, that's actually, oh, I think he was referring to the models of, uh, the models of, uh, morphogenesis, which is true. It's, they're probably wrong in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Dick has pointed to his book to give you an introduction to his, uh, position on morphogenesis and how, like if he was mentioning before how the, um, the positional information model might be wrong. So, I mean, again, it's like I said, I think the model's uh, comment fits there as well, applies there as well. So, uh, Susan Crawford Young, do they use Boltzmann's constant? And that was for what uh, model or context? The last slides. So on uh, neuroevolution or on, I don't think they use Boltzmann's constant on any of the models that I know of. Well, they may. I don't really know too much about like the deep technical details of some of these that I was introducing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that in... Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not really sure about the technical details for some of these approaches. So if it's... If some of these approaches, yeah, they may use... They use different... Uh, 
these different criterion for some of these models. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question really, but um, yeah, like I said, if I can send the slides out and if people are interested in a certain area, they can look into it a little bit more. Maybe we can uh, go a little bit further into the, uh, you know, in a later meeting, we can follow up on some of them. We've done that a couple times in this group where we've followed up on a certain topic if it's really interesting. So uh, any other questions on that? So yeah, the well, well, you know, I'll send out the slides. And again, if you have any specific uh, things you'd like to explore further, things you want to talk about, we can do that uh, offline, or you know, maybe next year or something. Um, but definitely keep like thinking about it. So I'd like to move on to a couple other things. So I was talking about next order of business is the GSOC proposals for 2020. And so, like I mentioned, this is something that we uh, have to start thinking about now to get into the swing of things. Oh, there's Ujwal again. Okay, he fell off the... There he is. Okay, Ujwal. Uh, we're now talking about GSOC proposals. So, um, so I have come up with a proposal for this year. Um, this is a pre-trained model. So, this is the one that I've come up with for Diva Worm. And... Uh, as you mentioned before, this is that Diva Worm is hosted through Open Worm. So what happens is that Open Worm goes to an organization called INCF, and we ask them for slots for they they sort of broker between us and Google for uh, slots for the program, and we usually get a lot of we usually get as many slots as we ask for. Uh, what happens in Open Worm then is we ask people from the different sub-projects to contribute proposals. So we usually have one proposal per sub-project because we need one mentor per sub-project. But we can have more if people want to be mentors or if I can get uh, people in other sub-projects to buy into the idea more generally. Um, and so the only limitations is are that the Proposals have to sort of be related to open worm uh, or related to something having to do with the brain since INCF is a neuroinformatics group. So, like, I've taken a lot of the Diva Worm stuff, I've kind of sold as like being relevant to like developmental neurobiology. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily do a lot of talking about that in the, in the uh, projects, like, but, but that's sort of the idea. So, we, this is the thing I have for this year uh, that I've written up, pre-trained models for developmental biology. And so this uh, developmental machine learning is actually what I've kind of included machine learning in this one. Uh, so this talks about a project that will center around building a pre-trained model for developmental biology and neurobiology. I had to put that in because of the our sponsor. Uh, our organization's machine learning interest group, and so this is our group here has published a blog post, and I'm going to cite the blog post here that we made on pre-trained models uh, on the advantages and need for pre-trained models in this area. So uh, biological development is characterized by char characteristic shapes, movements, changes in shape, and temporal processes that define important features. And then you kind of go into like what we kind of want to think about during this. So the each applicant will be writing a proposal and I'm trying to give them some idea of how to pose the proposal. So I kind of talk about what we're interested in, extracting spatio-temporal features from image data. And then the pre-trained model is described here as a, a network with non-random weights uh, that allows you to generalize about your problem space. And so, you know, in Linguistics, they have a certain set of pre-trained models that are specialized for language processing. There are other types of pre-trained models that give you like bounding boxes and things like that. But we don't really have anything that's, you know, maybe like developmental biology friendly or neurobiology friendly. And so that's what we're after here. And so then, 
you know, just to kind of talk about the assets of the Open Room Foundation, talk about your, you know, institutional support, and then the programming requirements. I see a typo there. Uh, programming requirements, which are listed right now as C++ and Python, and a machine learning platform such as TensorFlow or Keras. And I think that's, uh, I think there are probably other things I could add. Uh, I don't know about the languages. I think Python is, it, with speaking from experience, the best language for like an open setting, you know, where you're creating open source software and something that's, you know, relatable to a scientific computing context. Um, in our other group, we have someone who last year's GSOC student who is exploring different languages like uh, Julia and all these other languages, but that might be a little too obscure for some applicants. Uh, but I, and I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to go into a huge a debate about it now, but I'd like to hear people's feedback on this proposal. So I'm going to put, I'll send out a sort of a link to the proposal and then you can comment on it if you wish. Um, I, I think probably just in terms of, you know, maybe the mechanics of what we're after, if you think it's not really something that can be done in a, uh, you know, a summer long period. Um, but I'm trying to give them, you know, sort of bounds for their application. So people are going to write applications that are going to be, you know, they're going to have to come up with a timeline and all this stuff. And so they're going to have to define the parameters of what they do. But I want to make sure that the description is something they can get their heads around and like plan around. So, you know, if I get people who don't understand like how they're going to do X, Y, and Z in a summer, that's a problem because then we won't have very successful applications. Um, and I know Ujwal wanted to uh, talk about a proposal that he had. Um, so, I mean, we can, uh, you know, if you want to send me that proposal, that's great. Um, like keep in mind the things I was telling you before about the limitations for our submissions. Uh, what we also have an open worm is a data science initiative. So we have a bunch of groups that are trying to analyze data and it's biological type data, uh, surrounding C. elegans. Um, and last summer they had another project out of, I think Stephen Larson was being as the mentor, serving as the mentor for that. And he was serving as a mentor. Uh, they, you know, they did a lot of like format formatting issues, but there's a bigger sort of push within OpenWorm to sort of get a data science sort of uh, specialization where we can have people who can like get secondary data from different sources and bring them into our group and get it in a form that we can analyze and do things with. So uh, if Ujua was talking about medical images or something, um, that you might be able to fit that into one of those projects as well. If you, um, you know, maybe write it with a little bit of uh, relevance to open worm, the general open worm goal, you know, like I'm interested in developing a technique for image processing. It could be like, you know, uh, Im medical images or it could be images of a worm. Uh, you know, then we can maybe draw upon like the movement database, which we have which is online, we can draw from uh, other types of data, not just developmental data, but we can draw from, um, you know, different types of secondary data are out there, not even just image data, but we have data that are like gene expression data and, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> different types of uh, image, you know, we're extracting things like stains and, you know, fluorescent markers, so things that aren't like just segmenting cells, but you're actually measuring, you know, different, what's inside different cells, different regions of the worm, and like they're present, the, the sort of the, the level of fluorescence in those images. Okay, so today, let's see. Today I will talk about how we can extend last year's project briefly. The next meeting Okay, so I like propose new projects so we can find ways it should be this year, this year's project. So, Ojoal, why don't you uh, turn on your mic and let, why don't you say a few words about that?
Oh, hello everyone. So I'm Joel, and I'm like I would like to um, just a minute. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, I can't see your screen yet. So yeah, so today I would like to go uh, uh, give a brief about like how can we improve the last year projects so that uh, so. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. So this is the first of all brief about like what is the GSO timeline this year. So I don't know like whether you can see the image or not, but uh, so I can read it out. The organization applications are going to be open at January fifteen. Organization application deadline is at February six. So these are the first two goals which we have to keep in mind. Like other like organization announced and all these things are going to be around last of February. middle of march so what i have decided is like in the, this is going to be a meet one in which i am going to like then i want to propose like how we can revive the previous year project and how can we make them more and more accessible in the next meeting which will come on the next year i guess january 1st second week i would like to explore a new idea on it then we can decide which idea we are going to Pursue, and then we can in the meet for final audit draft will be shared, and you can all the suggestions are welcome. So, the, in my opinion, this year GSO motivation will be like to stick to a developmental biological image, biology of images. We are going to draft a project which can be improvement of previously existing DOMOM project, or it can be all new project. This year, I like I specifically want to focus to how to improve the reach of our group as well as our project. And and the open one open source foundation like one of the important pillar is public participation. We have the same interest as ours. So this year I would like to make our project or uh, group more and more accessible to the outer world, which has same interest as ours, so that our organization become more and more engaging with the, these kind of papers, and we can flourish at a very nice pace. So this time this is the what my according to me should be the. the uh, aim of our gsoc so the previous year projects in 2017 and 2019 are basically based on segmentation of c dot elegance through spin images so these are the just exact sentences of 2017 gsoc student siddharth yadav and 2019 vinay verma like what they have decided to do in their gsoc projects So I'm just going to read that through. So in 2017, the aim of the project was to find out the matter to a segment all the cells that are present in MYC dot elegance. They use the results of the segmentation to collect data about static location and division of cells in vector that describe the shape changes and overall position changes in the MYC. We have you. They have used spin microscopy images for data for research and all these. This is the same based. This is the follow up project in 2019. Which was completed by uh, I guess Vinay Verma. So, what is the work done so far? So this year Vinay has made a significant improvement to the project. Uh, like we, he has also deployed a very primitive web app for the what he have developed a tool and the link given this open one day itself. So first of all, let's switch to the um, GSOC. Yeah, this is the GSOC 2019. Project submission. So lots of work has been done already. Lots of some work is being pending and some in the to do list. So as we can see, like in the progress, we have seen like a semi supervised approach has to be begun, if I am right, and implementation of plugin development, scheduling additional time of enhancement. Web app is being made, but uh, we have to improve it. I guess like it is. Um, Made it is still it is perfectly working, but we need to make it more and more user friendly, in my opinion. And data for centroid position and labels. I guess this work is all. This is also something which is working. Work on labeling of the data and different cells. So these are in progress. I want to talk specifically about two 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 tasks which is not being completed, in my opinion. So refine segmentation for web app. Calculate error of the cell label position. Verify measurements of our data. Upload and view the sources. Segmented right field images. So this is the work done so far. This is the work which is in progress. I guess some of this work, according to me, have been completed, but it is not still in done portion. And to do is work which is not been touched yet. 
so we can also see like this is the web app which is being developed by Vinay Verma, previous year GSOC student. It is deployed on Heroku uh, web application. I guess it, it may be a Python or Django, some kind of. So this is the uh, web app which is being deployed. You can choose your files and upload them. And I guess it will give you some sort of segmented image. So coming back to our presentation. So what still needs to be done in this project? So as we have seen, like semi-supervised approach can be turned into an unsupervised approach. Uh, we are still we have done some this sort of work in Basilia project, which uh, me and my friend Ashmit is doing under the supervision of Radha Alicia and Richard sir. So in the next is labeling of the cells at different stages, improving web app. Increasing the reach of our apps using SEOs like search engine optimization, we can do some sort of thing so that it will become easy for the outside people to access our apps and access what we are developing. Like this will increase the reach of our group as well as what we are doing, world will know. And I guess like this is also one of the important things which we can make, like we can make library modules so that it can be used in Python course. Like they are the, in Python, publishing a library is much easier than in any other language. So if you are making something, I guess we can make a small libraries for that so that whenever a new person is coming or he has to do segmentation or something like that, he can simply import a library in his code and use our segmentation processor which we have used. So this will again reach our, the, our project, product, what you want to say, it's reach. Calculate an error in the cell label position matching reference point, segmenting right field image, and some other enhancements. So these are the enhancements which we have to do. So from this, we can get a gist like, we have to develop a web app, which is uh, improvement of the existing web app, and we have to make sure like what is being left in the project has to be completed during this year's GSOC project. So how to improve things? So these are, this is a kind of improvement cycle which we can apply. So as you can see, like we have applied in the digital basic media project, we have applied some uh, some sort of like advanced techniques like deep lab V3 and TensorFlow and pre-trained models. So we can use these kind of pre-trained models in our existing projects so that we can get more and more improved result. Second is improving on existing techniques is something like we can see like if we want some sort of uh, we have the data set how we can approach it. We might try to change the technique from the last year so it might or it may not improve the results or not we can check keep a check on that. Improving web app by making React native dashboards so like to, at this time the web app is on I guess based on Flask or Django application and it is a, it has primitive HTML pages and all. We can improve that web app by many folds during this GSOC so that we can make a complete final product so that whenever someone is trying to access our project, he can very easily interact with our project and so this will uh, make this project as well as group more and more reachable to the people outside who are interested in developmental biology and applying pre trained models as I have already explained. So what should be the approach of this project? So in my opinion, we have to break down this project into parts. First part is improving web app made by Vinay. So we can make some sort of login authorizing page because the data which we are going to give, it might be main for open source, it might not be main for open source. So we have to make sure that whoever is accessing our data, we have a and uh, we have a, some sort of check like who is accessing the data. It will help us to see how the uh, group reach is increasing as well as it will help us to keep a check who is accessing the data or not. Uh, request space to access our data like some data is all the data is not open source. I don't know much about like what kind of data we have but I'm sure like some data which we have we don't want to make it openly available. We only want to make it available to those who are working with us or want to work with us. 
uh, we can also make a dashboard side of things which in which we upload the image so it will give us all the statistics of what the image is being uploaded where is it centroid where it is like other error rates and all these things in a single dashboard which will make easier for the researcher to obtain readings and so that he can include you know in his project paper whatever he is doing uh, this can be extended to a one stop destination to access all the things which the worm offers it can be a overall web app where you can go and you can click on like what you need and this will help us like the, the all the things which can be accessed is in the one stop destination so he don't have to go to other websites so this can be one of the major part of this csg soft project uh, i think like this is a, this can be a project because last year many organizations like python and others have specifically focused on the web app and take a student just to improve their web app nothing else so this time we can also do that improving the segmentation techniques as we have said like we have applied a lots of techniques in basic area projects we can also transfer all these techniques in this project this year and see like if we can improve more and more results deploying the whole code in a package in library python library this is optional but must if we are including this this must be done in the part 2 so like if we are able to deploy our code in a python library it increases our reach by many many folds like any researcher who want to use segmentation for any biological image analysis he may use our library it might give good results it might give bad results these are the other topics but he can use our code base directly for his image so like in the platforms like as your notebooks and your Jupyter notebooks, collabs. You can easily use what we have made. So, if we are able to do this, we are able to accomplish this. This will be the one of the like biggest achievement for this year, piece of I guess. So, this is the how we can improve projects uh, this year. Uh, I have uh, made the final document for this, which I will share it over over the Slack. So, any kind of suggestion is welcome. and in the next meeting i will come up with those some sort of new projects if you want to achieve them and i guess we are end of this discussion so this is the brief outcome so if you have any sort of doubts you can ask on the chat or orally as you want okay so let's go into the chat right, yeah let's go to the chat ujwal yeah ujwal yeah hello yeah i can hear you yeah so uh, uh uh the presentation is very nice and like i uh, i could see you covered most of the topics and you uh, uh went through mine and uh, uh this of 2017's work so uh, there's definitely scope for improvement uh, what happened last like when what happened when i was a jso student that was that uh, we sort of went into uh, some uh, some dead ends on some uh, time delaying uh, events uh, like uh or working with java uh, there were not many uh, uh when i was working there were not many interfaces which would provide uh, uh machine learning for the uh, for the java language so that kind of delay uh, delayed the project and also uh, uh, uh like uh, the to do things that we have on the project uh, there are some there are some things that uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to st- not proceed with them because uh, me and dadli sir kind of saw some uh, difficulties if we if we were to uh, start those things i can definitely discuss uh, uh, discuss with you those things uh, what whether the what were the difficulties that i faced uh, uh, i gained uh, quite uh, quite a lot of uh, experience in that 3 uh, months Uh, where I learned to w- what may work and what may not work, so that it will definitely help you to not go and do the same mistake or uh, try the same method which did not work earlier. So I can definitely guide you on that. Um, and yeah, then, thank you. Uh, like this, it is like it will be very very beneficial for us to not waste on time like we have wasted in the past, and like this, it will be very helpful for me. 
uh yeah and also uh, the web app the idea that you have introduced that i haven't included is the dashboard thing right so that definitely sounds interesting to me because uh people can maintain a record of what they have uploaded in the past and also they can come back and refer to what uh uh what they have uploaded and the result analysis uh, uh and many and many more features if you can think of that and in uh in i i also uh have uh, some understanding of what needs to be improved in the project i can definitely uh, uh help uh, help you with that and also uh brightly sir knows uh, about this project like what what worked and what did not work so yeah uh, good work on this uh planning yeah yeah okay thank you yeah it was very good uh Uh, yeah, I'm glad that you brought up uh, extending the project from last summer. I think that's a very good idea, uh, and I will give you some feedback. And I think it's probably, uh, you know, probably be so. When when I did this with uh, Vinay, you know, we tried to figure out how to implement it. So now that it's been implemented in the web app, it's going to be, I think, a bit easier to get through some of the other parts that Vinay didn't have time to get to because we were trying to figure out how to get. The, the main part of it implemented so um i think yeah, an extension of this is a very good idea um i'm going to go to the chat um uh, and uh dick said uh, how about calculating the volume and surface area of each cell versus time so we have that that's another thing that we kind of did but didn't really get uh so the idea is that you're taking images and you're kind of like uh you know right now you have images and you can get the extract the data like cell size and things like that but we don't really have it like organized with respect to time explicitly that might be another thing that but that they you know that might be easy or hard to do it depends on on what's involved but we have the infrastructure in place already a bit so it isn't really that wouldn't be that hard to extend that devonch says a uh, I think you mean React JS and not React Native, which is meant for mobile apps. So I don't know if there was something in your slides about React. I mean, it's a small point, but by React Native, I mean native simple apps. Oh, that's visual. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. That's something that like not for native mobile apps. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, thank you for that as well. And we'll keep uh, send out. You you can put that on Slack. You can share it. Maybe share it as a uh, Google Doc, so that you know we can edit it uh, or you know turn the permissions on, so that people can you know get the link and edit it. And um, you know we can see. You know, I mean, there's some. It well, I mean, you know, you write it up kind of like how you presented it. I think it's a good. to reference like the past uh versions of the project and then what you would plan to do and then you know um give some like i well you don't really even need to give the idea of what code needs to be uh what coding languages need to be used you already know that so all right so that's that's good um so we'll continue this discussion probably in slack and i can loop people in via email um as well uh it's it's the top of the hour i wanted to continue a bit with a couple other things so if you have to leave now it's fine but we'll try to continue maybe for another 20 minutes uh what's what do we have here from venay we were able to extract cell centers and areas from images we can extend this to work on videos we have the algorithm and web app in place yeah i think that's that's true we do have the infrastructure for the for uh you know find figure out parameters of different things in the image so all right so good uh next i want to move on but, uh, oh which one do you have something to say no today? no uh it's me vinay so i wanted to remind you about this article that i have posted to you on slack uh this uh this paper that has been uh, published by google in this in this uh, es neurips conference it's about uh, uh uh it's about transfer learning for medical images uh, especially for medical images in that paper uh, they have analyze uh, they have like uh, conducted numerous experiments to analyze like uh, 
uh, reusability like uh, how good the performance has been improved uh, how much does it depend on the da- data that uh, that we have and the data that it has been trained on and also uh, it, uh, also is the performance increment good enough to uh, uh, to trust the model because uh, we cannot afford any uh, uh, many false positives or false negatives uh, when we are dealing with uh, 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 dealing with healthcare data so uh, uh, i wanted to bring that up uh, also we can use that paper to extend our blog post that we have written previously uh, you asked me to remind me this in the meeting so i can post the link for that article yeah please do uh, um yeah and so yeah vinay and I had a chat on Slack about that. So this link he's going to post is this paper. And so it's a paper that he found interesting on medical imaging and uh, transfer learning, and uh, which is something we haven't really talked about in this meeting too much. Um, and uh, we'll, you know, we can talk about that maybe in another meeting next year, but he wanted to point that paper out to people. Plus, he wanted to talk about perhaps extending the blog posts that we wrote on pre-trained models uh, in the direction of transfer learning. And so, I I think that's great. Um, I would I don't know if people want to participate in that. We can talk about it some more. Uh, but Vinay and I might like start up. Maybe a good way to do it is to start up a draft paper, and maybe this article would be a seed for that. Like go through the paper. And write down some ideas. Yeah, Jesse's interested. So um, you know, to get that like organized, and then eventually we'll do the same thing as we did for the pre-trained models blog post. It might be a bit shorter, but we'll get it organized. Maybe even offline or on Slack or something. We can figure out a way to write it. So that's something else interesting. Uh, Ujwal also, I think Ujwal is returning back to the. Uh, GSOC project, we can use Google Cloud this time so that our model runs at a faster rate, make our model model more complex. Yeah, that's all in optimizing the infrastructure that we have on um, OpenDevo cells. So, so yeah, the blog post, we can talk about that more as well. If you're interested, let me know, and then I can connect you into this uh, where, you know, where we end up doing it. Um, Please check out that paper link. And, but then I also wanted to talk about something with Vinay. You mentioned something, or actually, no, this is uh, actually for Jesse. So I'm going to share my screen again. And I want to talk about this paper that you uh, sent a while back. But um, so this one is uh, Reconciling Modern Machine Learning Practice and the Bias Variance Trade Off. And so you want to do a longer presentation on this later, but we, I just wanted to like talk about it a little bit today. And I'll, I'll send a link out to the group here in the chat on this paper. So you can actually look at the abstract and download the paper. And so let me go to the PDF here. Okay. So this paper is about the bias variance trade-off. And so, Jesse, can you describe what the bias variance trade-off is? Or I mean, uh, so the idea of this paper is the bias variance trade-off is uh, it's a, a problem that you find in a lot of machine learning algorithms where uh, so the bias variance trade-off implies that a model should balance underfitting and overfitting. So underfitting, of course, is when a model does not match the predict, you know, what it wants to predict. So it's not doing a very good job of predicting it. Uh, whereas overfitting is it's picking up on certain features and it's predicting over predicting those features, and it's you know it's not not giving itself enough sort of variance to to uh, find the able solution it's picking up on certain features and it's 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 uh re- over representing those things so underfitting and overfitting are things we don't want in our models and so in overfitting you're talking about fitting spurious patterns 
um, in underfitting, you're talking about um, not being able to figure out what the structure is. So they talk in this model, they actually talk about like some of the things that happened during the training period and the testing period of these algorithms. And they've actually come up with, um, let's see, what does Jesse say here? Dick. Uh, Dick actually had a comment. Machine learning for medical imaging. I sent it out following to my circulation list. Okay. Uh, so the, the, actually in this paper, they talk a little bit about that problem and then they introduce a new concept called the double descent curve, which is actually, so in the textbook literature, of machine learning, they talk about a U-shaped bias variance trade-off curve. So it's a U-shaped curve that they show in the paper right here in figure one. <clears throat> and this is where you have uh, the test versus the training data, where you have underfitting and overfitting. So uh, you, when you get to the like a middle, middle of the capacity uh, range here, you sort of minimize between underfitting and overfitting in the test case. Uh, you get this risk of overfitting um, in the test case where capacity is high. And they're saying that this is something that, you know, this is the traditional view. What they're talking about now is the double descent risk curve, which actually shows if you observe a lot of behavior of high capacity algorithms, you actually begin to see this uh, pattern, which is where you have this classical regime and then this modern interpolation regime here. So this is like a different, a little bit different way of like thinking about the uh, the trade-off. Um, they use this, I think they actually use this on real models and they're using, you know, so they're, the, the old model kind of comes from earlier methods of machine learning and this one is actually based on looking at data sets that exist in the real world in real applications. And so they basically are improving upon this model. And they go through uh, talking about how this double descent curve works in neural networks. So they go through some of the math. And then they actually are able to use this, you know, model it theoretically. So there's some nice graphs in here that show how this idea works. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to talk about in this paper. Um, so they so they just talk about it as being a better having a better understanding of model performance, and so they kind of talk about how this opens up new lines of inquiry to study uh, the properties of these. So this is, has to do with the properties of networks themselves. So we were talking about this with the uh, in last week's talk about the, you know, sort of the inherent properties of these models and how they're understudied. And this is one example of where they're actually studying sort of the basic attributes of these models. Uh, well, how do they work? And do we really know all we need to know about these models? And so I think that's a good paper uh, to read over on your on yourself by yourself. Um, uh, Jesse is going to give a long, longer presentation on it in the new year, so I look forward to that. So Dick has a question. He has a link that's too big to paste here. What do I do? Um, you can send it to me, and I can send out an email after the after the meeting on this. I can send the link. Like in, in the email, I'm going to send out some materials on what we've been discussing here. So you can just do that. Send it to my email and then I'll send it out to everyone else. Because I don't know how long the link, how long the link they accept in this chat. I don't know why it wouldn't work, but, um, yeah, that's just, just send it in an email and I'll send it out. We can also, you could also use like a tiny URL if you, wanted to uh, shrink it down. Okay, so Jesse says, uh, sorry I don't have a lot of ability to communicate in depth right now, but 
We'll give a more, a more full presentation on this in the future. Oh, the size of text, not a link. I'll send it as a file. Yeah, you'd have to send me the file. Can't send files in this uh, meeting space. Um, but yeah, send me the file via email. It should work in, on Gmail. So the final thing I wanted to talk about was this uh, thing that Vinay brought up uh, I think on Twitter. And they talked about this, and I actually saw this before. It was about Jeff Hinton is now suspicious of backpropagation. And I saw some rumblings about this earlier this week. Uh, some of the people who follow the NeuroIPS discussions. So this is a, uh, something on Quora that someone posted. Um, so they talked about, so Jeff Hinton is the inventor of sort of deep nets. Uh, I don't know, there's some dispute as whether he's the absolute inventor of it, but he was, uh, he did one of the, the papers that's most well known. Um, so neural networks actually started in the 1980s. And, uh, backpropagation came about back then as well. So, like, there were a couple papers that were published on neural networks with backpropagation. And it led to this whole explosion of work in neural networks. Uh, backpropagation, of course, is essentially feedback. And so this, oh, I'll send this link out to the group too. So this is a link here. This is this Quora discussion. And basically they're talking about, um, they're talking about backprop and how it's, although it's adequate for modeling, it's not really the way the brain does it. So, one point is that uh, backpropagation over deep neural networks is about as much to do with the brain, how the brain learns, as modern jet airplanes have to do with the way birds fly. Both jets and birds fly, but they do so using entirely different principles. So what, you know, jets can do things that birds cannot. Birds can do things that jets cannot. So, you know, backprop is, is like feedback in a neuron, as we saw in the talk today, but it doesn't do it in the same way. And so, therefore, it's not, we can maybe do better. Uh, actual neurons in the brain largely work by spike trains, which we also talked about in today's talk. Each neuron is sending out da dit da messages, which are like Morse code to neighboring neurons. So there's a temporal aspect that modern neural networks aren't picking up on. Um, let's see. So apparently Francis Crick was very skeptical of neural network models. He made the analogy to Aristotle, who simply declared that men have more teeth than women, of course. If Mr. Aristotle had simply looked inside Mrs. Mrs. Aristotle's mouth, he would have discovered that she had the same number of teeth and was obviously wrong. I, I guess that's a, I don't know exactly how that fits together, but uh, similarly, Crick felt that neural network modelers were simply largely ignorant of the way the brain worked and the linear, real neurons worked, which is maybe a fair criticism, but you know, it's, uh, you know, we're trying to abstract function from, you know, something. So, I mean, it's a pretty good attempt, but it's not biology necessarily. Um, deep learning models are incredibly wasteful of training data. So we've talked about that. And uh, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning must be the primary modes of learning because labels mean little to a child growing up. In other words, we don't need supervised learning to learn like children do. Children learn in unsupervised ways, and that's really kind of the key to learning. So supervised learning is, we do some of that, but we also do a lot of unsupervised learning, and that's where you have to focus your efforts. And so I think that's an interesting set of uh, commentary there. Uh, if you want to look look at that some more and think about it, uh, please do. So, uh, like I mentioned, this is our last meeting of the year. Uh, thanks everyone for participating, and especially to those of you who have made every meeting. Uh, I was very appreciative. Uh, I think this went pretty well. Um, next year we'll start in January. We'll do some more uh, meetings, and we'll you know come up with some new topics. Uh, please, you know, feel free to contact me over the next two weeks or so if you have any 
ideas if you want to participate in the blog post and the like. And I'll get in contact about the schedule for next year. I think we'll probably do it at a similar time. Okay, uh, Dick sent me a paper by email. So I'm going to be sending out an email summarizing some of the points from this meeting. And then I'll be in contact towards the new year about uh, ne our meeting schedule for next year. And have a good holiday, everyone. Uh, thanks for meeting once again. And I'll see you on Slack or online. Um, thank you. Bye.